Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Nikki Freeman, and I am the Director of Education at the Holocaust Memorial Miami Beach. On behalf of the Holocaust Memorial, I'd like to welcome you to today's program with Yad Vashem educator Liz Elsby. This event is part of the Holocaust Memorial's ongoing series of educational programming taking place during Holocaust Education Week. These programs are sponsored by the Florida Department of Education, the State of Florida Department of State, Division of Arts and Culture, and the City of Miami Beach Cultural Affairs Program, Cultural Arts Council. I would also like to extend a special thank you to the Greater Miami Jewish Federation for their ongoing support. It is my honor today to introduce Liz Elsby, who has worked at Yad Vashem since 20, uh, 2006 as a museum tour guide, Holocaust educator, lecturer, and content writer for Yad Vashem's website and social media. She guides educational groups in Poland, Prague, Terezin, and Berlin. She's also an Echoes and reflection, Reflections facilitator, teaching American educators how to teach the Holocaust effectively to their students. Liz also has a particular interest in Holocaust art with an emphasis on Terezin. She's a working illustrator and graphic designer, often incorporating Holocaust themes into her artwork. Today, she's presenting Theresienstadt, Story of the Ghetto through its art, music, and poetry. Thank you so much for joining us today, Liz. All right, so wonderful. So that's working. Thank you for such a, am I still muted? Can you hear me? You're good. Fabulous. So first of all, everyone, thank you for, for joining in. I'm sorry there's a hurricane. I hope it goes by um, without too much damage. So let me put this on. All righty, can we see? Is this seeable? Yes, we are good. Fabulous. All right, friends. Um, so I'm gonna to present today about Terezin. I'm gonna call it Terezin, which is Czech uh, pronunciation. We also call it Terezinstadt. So Terezin is, is shorter. Um, and I wanna begin that saying you don't need to have a PhD in art to understand art and to understand the language of art. And if the Holocaust is a human story, this is what human beings did to other human beings. Art is such a human thing, art, music, and poetry. It's how we express ourselves. It's how we, it's a, a, a prism of how we can see the world and how we can relate to the world. And as such, I think it is a very beautiful way of understanding a place as awful as Terezin, kind of dichotomy, a beautiful way of understanding something terrible. And I'm gonna begin with this quote by the Holocaust survivor, Aaron Applefield, or Applefeld, and he says this in 1994, art constantly challenges the process by which the individual person is reduced to anonymity. And as you're going to see in the artwork today, by focusing on the individual, again, by focusing on the human story, uh, we are stopping these people from just becoming a number, just becoming a statistic, even if we don't know who the person um, whose drawing we'll see is pictured, even if we don't know who they are, it gives us a human face. It shows us a window into their humanity, which I think is why art is so special. Um, for the students watching, I want to show you a way that you can use art. Really, um, if you do your own project about the Holocaust, if you would, you know, have a subject you would like to um, explore more, please incorporate art into it. Um, I'll, I'll teach you methods that you can use this to to make part of your own um, memory. Okay, so we're going to begin with the Jews of Prague. And I just got back from Prague two days ago with my son. I have a very strange connection to Prague. My family were all Jews from Grodno and from Latvia. So I don't have a family connection. Um, but when we talk about Czech Jews, and before we talk about the art, it's a little introduction. Um, Czech Jews were a bit different than Polish Jews. Um, Polish Jews, many of them spoke Yiddish. The, um, the Hasidic movement had been born in the lands, um, which is today Poland and Ukraine. And there was um, more followers of that tradition in Poland. Czech Jews were very akin to German Jews. They didn't speak Yiddish. There was no real Hasidic movement that was born in the Czech lands. By the 20th century, 19th century, many Czech Jews were very acculturated. 
It doesn't mean they weren't religious Jews, there were, but they were very much part of the Czech culture. They spoke either German or after the 1860s, many Czech Jews were speaking Czech. There was a revival of the Czech language that happens in the 1860s. Um, and for the most part, um, their lives were different than Jews who would have lived in a shtetl um, in, the, in Ukraine somewhere. They were much more urban. Um, they, they spoke again, um, the um, English, um, German or Czech, and their fate very closely aligns to the fate of the fate of German Jews. Because what happened to the Jews of Germany is already in 1941, when Auschwitz is not yet functioning as a camp for Jews. The first Jewish transport to Auschwitz is in March 1942. And just like the Jews of Germany, the Jews of Prague and Brno and other cities in Czech, Czech, today the Czechoslov Czech Republic, then an area that had been taken over by the Nazis called the, um, called the Protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia, they are sent to the east some of them to Ludge, Ludge Ghetto, some of them to Minsk, to Mali Trotsdam, a death camp that's set up there. And I just wanna show you an example of that. And again, I'm, I always want you to see the human face. This little plaque here, which is very, very small, it's on the sidewalk in a street called Praviska Street in Prague, which is a very pretty street, a lot of fancy shops. And as you walk in the street, you look up and see the shops and the beautiful architecture. But this project created by a German artist is called Stoppelsteiner, the tumbling, stumbling blocks. You look down at this beautiful building and you see the name of a family. And among the names of that family is a little girl called Eva Abosova, who was born in 1930. And when she was about 11 years old, she and her family were taken from their home, taken from Prague, from that beautiful street sent to the ghetto in Lodz, in, in uh, Polish Łódź, and she did not survive. Almost 5,000 Czech Jews were sent to Łódź ghetto and only about 200 plus survived. So this is the first act against the Jews of Czech Republic, the Bohemia and Moravia, to be sent away to, um, to the east. It's not quick enough, it's not effective enough, it's not efficient enough, and there's still a lot of Jewish people left in that area. So already at the conference that takes place in, um, in Wannsee in January 1942, the idea of sending the Jews closer to home to a garrison town that's in Czech, it's called Terezin, and in German it's called Theresienstadt, is already kind of thrown around that this could be used as a foil to first fool elderly German Jewish people and German Jewish people, and eventually as a way of fooling the world by 1944, as this is going to be a better place. And we'll talk all about that as we go along. So let's set the stage. Terezin is named after this lovely lady um, who was one of history's uh, famous anti-Semites. Her name was Emperor Maria Theresa. She was the Empress of the Austria-Hungarian Empire. She throws the Jews out of Prague in the, 16, in the 1740s. Not a very nice lady. And the Jews aren't around back in, I think another 15 or 20 years. So Theresienstadt is named by her son in her honor. And what it is, is an old garrison town. And today we don't really understand what garrison towns are. We don't need them um, in a modern world. But these were set up um, not too close from the borders with Germany, these old, this particular town, as a way of protecting the Czech lands, Bohemia and Moravia, from attack. It was already obsolete when it was built. It was built in 1780. How do you put soldiers in a garrison town? You support them. You keep them safe inside very thick walls. These walls are more than five meters thick. The town is very small. Like most little towns, it's built off of a market square. There's also a concentration camp attached to it. That's called the Little Fortress. Our talk is going to mainly stay in the talk with the ghetto. And by the beginning, the end of um, 1941, by November 1941, where the first transports of Czech Jews arrive here, the place is an old beat up town, um, had 7,000 people living in there, had great big, huge army barracks, which were pretty much in, un, uninhabitable 
1941. They had been used briefly in World War I, but by this point, they are filled with lice and fleas, and there's not any enough toilets. There's no beds. There's nothing really to, to house a huge influx of people. And already beginning with a group called the Aufbau Commando, and they're the ones who arrive, about 200 young men, and they're sent there in November 1941 to get the place ready. Soon, scores and scores of Czech Jews are simply taken here by train and dumped into this very desolate, difficult place. And this is what it looks like from the air, even today. Um, you can see um, the great big barracks. This is where the Jews are mainly gonna be living. All of the Czech people who weren't Jewish here were already left, were, were forced to leave by the summer of 1942. And it becomes also a concentration camp, also a ghetto, and also a transit camp. So it has three purposes. A place where you send Jews to be concentrated and to work. A place where they'll be forced to live together but have a little bit more freedom. They'll be able to wander the streets after, 19, after the summer of 1942. They'll be able to visit each other. But the people in charge of the ghetto is the SS. They didn't have to wear a uniform in this terrible ghetto like you would in a concentration camp. But perhaps the most horrific part of all of this is the transports taking place, sending Jews to the East. And if you see here, these are actual artwork that was created in the ghetto by Jews who were forced to make art for the Nazis. And we could see from the Reich, which is Germany, 56,923,000 Jews were there already by 1943. Ostmark, which is Austria, 15,000. The Protectorate, that is the modern day Czech Republic, about 70,000 Jews. Denmark, 464,000 Jews. Holland, 1,450. And from here, this is the places they're arriving from to be sent to this terrible place. And who makes this artwork? You might be thinking artwork, concentration camp. How, how does that blend together? When do people have time to make artwork? Who gave them the art supplies? Why would the Nazis let people make artwork? Well, the answer is a pretty simple one. There are some incredibly talented people, Jewish people in Central Europe. Um, it's a place where it's very, um, very cultural, even today, music and theater and magazines and art and, and all kinds of things. And the Jews are very much involved in that. The Nazis are going to exploit their talents. And as a way of kind of making this place look better to the higher ups in Berlin, say, look how efficient we are. Look how a good job we are. Look how we're working and look how we're putting these Jews to work. They set up technical workshop which the Jews were in charge of, where they would make mainly charts and all kinds of um, material for the bosses in Berlin. And these charts are very beautifully decorated, very beautifully made. These are very talented artists, but look at the conditions. And I can tell you as uh, someone who went to art school before we really started using computers, when you're drawing like this next to someone else and you erase something or they spill ink on your drawing, it's a very cramped, hard conditions to make artwork in. You need a little room. And the artist who made this drawing, his name is Leo Haas. And Leo Haas is one of the very few artists of this group who survive. Almost all the others were sent to Auschwitz. The artists actually fight back against the Nazis in the only way they can. They draw art to show the horrors of the ghetto. And they're caught in June 1941, 44, excuse me. They're sent to the Little Fortress, which is the concentration camp. And three of them are some, there were actually almost seven of them who were sent there, but only two of them survived. And Leo Haas is one of them. And we'll talk more about him in a minute. So this is how the artists are making this artwork for the Nazis. And this is the kind of artwork the Nazis are expecting. And this is by another great artist, one of my heroes, his name is Bedjik Frita. And this is showing them building the barracks. Now, what do the higher ups in Berlin think when they see this? They're thinking, oh, look how they're working. Look at the nice uniforms, look how orderly, look how professional, look how efficient the staff is, look what a good job they're doing. This is the artwork the artists created for the Nazis but they have another job. They want us to see what this ghetto is really like. So we're gonna see an amazing drawing by the artist Bedrick Frita. 
Lyphen, no, it's not Pedrick Fita, excuse me, it's Leo Haas. Uh, the name is wrong here, but the artist is Leo Haas, which is kind of a cheat sheet of what Terosine is, of everything going on there. And I'm going to break this up into little sections, and we're going to explore these sections through art. So if we look at an overview, the first thing we notice is how incredibly crowded this is how different the people are. People are coming, people are going, people are riding in a hearse over here. People are sitting, um, elderly people. We see it, corpses, we see music going on. Let's examine each one um, separately. When we see the elderly people, that is really one of the terrible stories of this ghetto that is kind of forgotten. There is a tendency to remember Theresienstadt through the incredible art and music and performances that went on here. And we will talk about those towards the end. But we're also gonna talk about that many, many elderly people are sent to this ghetto from Germany and Austria in the summer of 1942. And those people lived and died in that ghetto like ghosts. Most of them, we don't even know what they look like. We don't know anything about them. Many of them die in the ghetto. When you try to look up records of these people, they will tell you the official record keepers in Theresienstadt, we don't have a lot of records of these poor people who came and went. And it's the artists who are gonna show us who they were. So we see here in the window, elderly woman sitting in very crowded barracks. What I love about the artist Leo Haas, he gives us little, little clues, little things to look at. And if you look here, look at this little clue. Here we have this elderly woman sitting, eating her paltry meal. Does everyone see the skeleton? reflected here in the window. This is not going to end well. We see here old people sitting in an attic, boiling hot in the summer, freezing cold in the winter. We see among them people who are blind, and not Europe, people who had a three, a band with three balls on it. Those are people who are blind, legally blind. We see here, we'll see closer up in a minute. Um, let me go here. We see people waiting in long lines to eat out of barrels. And we're not used to standing in line eating in a barrel. In a normal world, we sit at a table. We put the food on the table. It's, it's a pleasure. We sit, we enjoy, unless we're eating a hot dog somewhere. Um, people in those days were much more formal. Food was eaten at tables. People are standing up and getting food out of a barrel. We often think that's what prisoners get, people who are in prison who have done something bad and are being punished. To these people, the one crime they committed in the eyes of the Nazis was the crime of being Jewish. I'll go back a step here. We see some very interesting and unusual things amid all of this squalor and all of these people coming in, in the attics where people can't see, where it's away from prying eyes. Do you see what's happening here? We see music happening. And notice how the artist, Leo Haas, has kind of made a little cutaway so we can see what's happening. So much is going on in this building. In the attic, music is happening. And here we have a performance and people are watching. Go forward again. We see that in this ghetto, despite the horrors, people still wanted to be Jewish. And even if Czech Jews were not um, particularly orthodox, for many of them, once they came to Telezin, they wanted to explore why, why were we sent here? What does it mean to really be Jewish? Some Jews came back to being Jewish, really the following halakha in the ghetto. We see children and babies. It's something that's hard to imagine, children in such a terrible place. We see people coming and going. There's a constant flux of people coming. And we see two things that are very touching. In the far off corner of the building, we see what may be the artist himself looking out over the barbed wire fence at freedom, at a day, a new day that's dawning. He can't be part of that day, but maybe one day freedom will be restored. And in almost every one of these drawings, you'll see the hands drawing. They were also in that drawing of the workshop. He's bearing witness. He's using his artwork as a way of showing us this is to show you what this ghetto is like. So let's examine some of those things that we saw in that cheat sheet. So first of all, I'm gonna take you to, the, um, to Berlin. 
And this is a man called Philip Manns. He was already in his 60s by the time the Nazis came to power and things got very, very bad. He was a furrier in Berlin. He was like many people in that central Europe and that Germany he was very cultured, cultured Jew. He goes to concerts and lectures besides his business. He wants to be a man, a cultured man. He was able to get his his grown children are able to leave Germany. They were lucky. And if you know why they were lucky, because most countries in the world would not accept Jews, desperate refugees. And most of the elderly people in our story were alone. They had managed, their, their children had managed to leave the country. Some of them very sadly went to places like Holland, and the most famous, of course, being Anne Frank, where they were also um, eventually caught and murdered. Anyway, he can't leave. He has an elderly mother who's in the home for the elderly, um, which we'll talk about in a minute. And he and his wife are in Berlin. And he's forced to work as a slave laborer. Can you imagine this man? He's in his late 60s. He's retired. And he has to work as a slave laborer for, in a factory for the Nazis. And he faces a very bleak future. And remember, most of these German Jews had fought for Germany in World War I. They, German Jews had lived in Germany since Roman times. They were German first, Jewish second. And now it's this terrible situation. He has no place to go. But in the Jewish community center, the Jews are being fooled. They have to, um, the, the Jewish leaders in the center are forced to present this document to people who own homes that the home is going to be exchanged for a home in the spa town of Tavosin. That's how it's sold to them, the spa town of Theresienstadt. And he writes this, Theresienstadt had been described to us as a paradise for which our fortunes had been sacrificed. That's what the people had said in the small room, this is in the Jewish community center, where a table had been set up by the Jewish community. They told us the next day that everything would be seized by the state and it could only be saved by transferring it immediately. The community would secure these endangered assets and put them to good use. One enthusiastically signed the forms and left the room with a good feeling. So what's happening here? The Nazis also fooled the Jewish community. They said, listen, people are going to give their homes away for a home in the spa town. They have to sign this legal document. And so it's legitimate, right? And the legal document is telling them that they're going to get a home in the spa town. They're going to get three square meals a day. They're going to get um, laundry service um, in exchange for the home that they're in now. And people have to sign it. And once Philip Mann signs it, like so many other German Jew, um, Jews from Berlin, he's forced into what was the Jewish old age home that had been built in the 1820s. The Nazis had removed most of the furniture and most of the kitchens. So this is just like an empty shell of the building. People are taken to this terrible place where some of them are living there for three or four days. Imagine elderly people, people in their 80s, with no toilets, no beds, no place to slot, lie down. And then they're sent to about four different train stations throughout Berlin. This one um, is a place, um, it's called Anhalter Station and it was bombed during the war. You can't really feel too bad about the fact that it was bombed because when you go to that station today, and I, my daughter lives in Berlin for a while, so I took this picture. It says in German, from this station, 9,500 Jewish, elderly Jewish people were sent to Berlin. Um, from Berlin to Theresienstadt, where the vast majority of them did not survive. So they're being sent to Theresienstadt, which is going to be almost called an old age ghetto. For a brief time in 1942, the average age of everyone in Theresienstadt was 75. And you can see here, when you go to Berlin, there's a station called the Green, uh, Grunewald Station. You can see the ages of the people sent to Telezin. We have Johanna Gumpel, who was 95 years old. Hermann Goldstein, who was 89 years old. These people were born, um, you know, way, way before uh, the beginning of the 20th, the 20th century, and they are murdered in Telezin. When they arrive, they don't arrive to the ghetto. They have to walk almost 3.9 kilometers, Bohusovice, the train station, into the ghetto. It's a very long walk. 
and I've done the walk, even if you're young and fit, if it's rainy, if it's snowy, it's a schlep. If you are 95 year old Hannah Gumpel walking with your little bags, it's almost impossible. And the artist wanted us to know how hard that walk was. And this is a piece of uh, drawing created by a little girl called Helga Vaisova. And I'm gonna tell you her whole story in a minute. But from the youngest little kids who are drawing, and she's an amazing child, and I'll tell you a little bit more. She's showing us these, are these poor people arriving, exhausted and tired with their children and their packages and whatever little things they could bring in the 50 kilos that are, they're allowed to bring in, walking under a guards, armed guards, from Bohusovice, from the town next door, into the ghetto. These are the people who can walk. What happens if you're 95-year-old uh, Mrs. Gumpel? This is what happened to many elderly people. And this drawing is by Leo Haas. And when he makes these drawings, he is mad. I really believe this artist was angry. And he wants us to see. And you know, when you take a photograph, you touch the button and it takes a minute and the picture is taken. When you make an artwork like this, you're thinking about every line, every little nuance. And what we see here is an SS transport of people who arrive at the train station, who, and it's called the, the typhus transport. So these were like sick people who arrived. And instead of being forced to walk, these people were so sick that they are just taken into the ghetto on a, on a truck and pretty much dumped in there when they get there. And let's look at them together. First of all, these poor people are not sitting on comfortable chairs. They're in the back of a truck. All the truck has to do is go over a bump. It's on a muddy road, kind of gets stuck in the mud and people are gonna fly off. And you'll notice that some of them are not alive anymore. We have people who are obviously dead. We have feet sticking up in the air. We have this man who's slumped over. The only one who's looking at us in this whole picture, really kind of get, cutting us right in our eyes is this man. And we're not sure if he's even alive. He's on a stretcher, he may not be, but he kind of is grabbing us with the, his eyes and making a dialogue with us. Why is this happening? Remember us. Someone is sitting on him. Notice there's no names here. This is someone's name. It's now been reduced to a number. People are on their little packages. And in case we have any doubt who did this, it says here, SS. These are the people who did this to us. And that's how so many elderly people arrive in this terrible camp. When they arrive, they have to go to a place where they're sometimes waiting two or three days. Everything they have is stolen from them. And the German Jews arrive in this ghetto beginning in June, 1942. Remember the first group of people to fix the ghetto up only arrives in November, 1942. They didn't have enough chance to make beds for all of these people who are arriving. The only toilets are downstairs. There's 82 steps to go from these attics down to the bottom floor where the toilets are. And the elderly people are housed in the attic. And unless we try and judge the people in that ghetto, do you understand that it's not their choice to do this? This is what the Nazis forced on them because Jews have to work in this ghetto. Remember, it's also a concentration camp. They're labor, they have to work. People have to work 15 hours a day if they're able to. There's children in the camp. Children have to eat. Children have to have better conditions. Children have a future. Where do you put all of these masses of elderly people who need care? And the answer is they have to be put in the attics because there's not enough place for everybody. So this is the artist, Bedrick Frita. And he's also very angry and very upset. And he wants us to see this is how our grandparents, this is how our elderly generation, this is how these people who are in their last years of life deserve to have a comfortable bed and a hot meal and someone to take care of them and dignity of going to the bathroom. All of that's been taken away from them here in this hell of Telezine. And let's take a look closer look. First of all, if you look here, we see this elderly blind person. He's gonna fall over this. This place is a hazard. We see people who are sitting on the floor. The attic is boiling hot in the summer. People are taking their clothing off. Notice again, the artist does not have anyone looking directly at us. And this artist, Bidrik Frita, before the war, he was a cartoonist. So he doesn't want to make these people look realistic. That's not important to him. He wants us to feel the suffering. 
And you know what one of the worst things about this drawing is? Every one of these people had a past had hot likes and dislikes and hopes and dreams, and they've probably done nice things with their lives and maybe had raised children and who knows what. Here in the attic, all they are is a number. They're anonymous in this miserable place. Look at these people. People are lying on the floor. People, look at this poor lady here. Some people are, are have um, dementia. We see these people who aren't even looking at each other. And everywhere we see suitcases with numbers. That's to remind us of this. We see a woman holding a clock next to a suitcase. And Zdenek Letterer, who was one of the first um, writers about this ghetto, one of the first people who writes about his experiences, says this, when Seidel, the camp commander, was informed about the high mortality in the ghetto in September 1942, he only said the clock ticks well thus epitomizing the German aims in a single sentence. In other words, the conditions are so awful, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, the conditions will, will, will do the work for us. So we see, again, remember I said these artists use symbols, kind of bring us into what's happening. Time is running out. We sit with suitcases when we're going to be sent away. And almost 16,000 elderly people were sent on what we call the Alta Transporte. 10,000 of them went to, uh, to Treblinka and only about five or six of them survived. There were more elderly people, um, younger people who were sent in some of the transports. One of them survives the uprising at Treblinka and to a terrible camp called Mali Trostinets in Minsk. How did children feel about all this? And I'm talking now to our students. Well, you can imagine children had no idea how to relate to people who were kept in such terrible conditions. And Tolman Broad said this, we children would of course see them, the elderly from time to time, not that we would go visit them in their homes. That was something so repellent that we were disgusted. And it was also dangerous. There were bed bugs and fleas. It was simply horrible, horrible conditions. But also, they organized young people who lived in, spe in special houses um, would sometimes be organized to go and help elderly people to, if they saw them wandering in the streets lost, to bring them back to their homes where they were staying, to help them go find food, to talk to them, to pick them up if they fell down. We see that in the children's magazine I'll be talking to you about soon, that pe young people are told, don't be passive. Think of your own grandmother who was sent to Poland who's already dead. Think of this as someone's grandmother, stand up and do something for them. Um, so even in the place where people are living in such horrible conditions, there are people who are trying to help them, but it's an impossible task. Here is the artist Norbert Troller, who was also an, mainly an architect, but he draws the Hanover barracks and the steps. And he writes here, 42 steps in one flight and two of these flights. And the old people live in the attic, in the hot attic and die there. Can you imagine poor 90-year-old Mrs. Goldberg going up and down 94, um, 84 steps every day to go to the bathroom, 84 steps every day to go eat. The architecture itself becomes an enemy of these people. And look at this drawing he makes of this woman trying to struggle up the steps. And it's like almost like a, a mouth that's swallowing her up. So the conditions for elderly people are fatal. Again, this is what is imposed on the Jews. It's not something they want. It's not something they, they <laughs> can really do anything about. The overcrowding in the ghetto is terrible. And remember I told you the artists have to make artwork for the Nazis. Petr Keen, who was a brilliant young artist who was also murdered in 1944, um, makes this, um, this, um, this chart for the Nazis, this, this book to show how the overcrowding has improved by 1943. So here, the height of the overcrowding in 1942, we see um, people between the ages of 16 and 55, there's 17,715 persons. Young children up until the age of 15, 2,761 persons. But over the age of 55, we have 32,788 people. It's so incredibly crowded. 
And he also makes this drawing. We'll see this theme again and again and again. Look how people are living in the ghetto in 1942. They're living in attics. They're living in shops. They're living in stables. They're living in underground cellars. They're living wherever you could pack a human being. And transports are arriving every day with more and more people. Where do you put everyone? Where do you, how do you feed everyone? How do you keep people working? What a horrific dilemma. And the artists want us to see. And this is Leo Haas again. Remember, these artists are angry. And he shows us people living in what was once a butcher shop. And I was in Prague a few days ago with my son and on the street we were staying at, there was a butcher shop that has the same name. I have to name a check for a butcher shop. It had a pig's head hanging in the window. And we see that here. But butcher shops are something useful. You go in and you get food. Here, the butcher shop has been, has been turned into a place where you store human beings. These poor elderly people are being forced to live in a form of butcher shop, by the way, you see it here also, this is the German word for butcher shop. This artist has also joined the butcher shop. And let's take a closer look. Um, so we see this says in Czech, fresh meat, which is very, um, very cynical. Fresh meat, what's the fresh meat here? It's these poor dying people. We see this elderly man who we know is blind. Remember I said the three dots walking along the street. In a minute, he's going to put his cane into this, um, this sewer hole and fall in. We see people in, sleeping in the windows. Look at the jagged glass in the windows. How dangerous. People, uh, there's no chairs for them to sit on. They're sitting on the windowsill with the broken glass. People are sitting on the floor. There's a child sitting here whose stomach is bloated. And notice yet again, it's the same artist who likes to draw the skeletal reflection in the mirror, in the window. This is going to be this child's fate. We even see people who have come to bury someone who died or also have no energy, no strength and have stopped there with their, the person they're burying and they're just kind of wiping their brows off in the heat. Um, this is a place where, where even something, the present, the death is always present and it's not something that even you look up to, you, you get shocked by anymore. Here's another drawing by Bidrick Frita, also showing another artist, the, the former shop and the butcher shop. But there's something here that is very amazing. These artists have a secret, secret symbol for themselves. It's a V, like a V for victory. And they're well aware that the artwork they're making is dangerous. It's showing the horrors of the ghetto, which the Nazis did not want us to see. So each of these artworks is like a, a sign of resistance. So we'll see that V in a lot of these works. Hunger is always present here. And if we're talking about elderly people again, they get the worst food. And why does that happen? Most of the people in this ghetto were Czech Jews. And the Czech Jews had access to packages from outside of the country, they, um, from the country. They could get Red Cross packages if someone in the family or a friend or someone from the community would send them every once in a while a package. Also, younger people worked. If you worked, you might be able to barter for food. Most of the elderly people at this point in 1942 are elderly German Jews. They don't speak Czech, only speak German. Most of them are alone. They don't have someone who can send them a package. And most of them do not work. So they have no way of bartering for food, which means they have to live on the horrible rations they're given in the camp. In 1942, people are eating things like synthetic lentil soup. And they would gather down those 84 steps and have to stand in front of the barrel. Remember I showed you in that first overall view of Terezin that the people standing in front of that barrel like prisoners. And here they are with their little bowls in their hand, almost like Oliver Twist, you know, please sir, I want some more. How humiliating, these poor elderly people. There's no place for them to sit down. They're gonna have to sit down on the ground. A nice hot meal has been denied them. They have to stand there. And if the bowel runs out and the meager, whatever this is, potatoes run out, then the people are gonna starve. And people write in memoirs of Tavazin, or when people wrote about Tavazin, they'd write about people begging for food and how 
you know, the, the people lost all of their dignity. They would come and please give me your soup, please give me your soup. And the soup was so awful that they would just give them to the elderly people. They're the only ones who would eat it. And here we have a close up. And then of course, people are dying in this ghetto. They did have hospitals that are set up. Some of them had very good health care. They had a lot of nurses, a lot of doctors. However, there is a disease that's called, that we'll see in a minute, that comes from um, dysen, dysentery, um, gastroenteritis that many elderly people got just from eating such bad food. And there really wasn't a lot of help you can give these people. They really just died like flies. And here we have a ward. You can see people are lying on the floor. Look at all the dirt, look at all the dishes near them. These are very thin people lying on a bedpan which is poking into their bones. Um, and Norbert Troller writes this, one of the auxiliary wards for old people, all of them suffered from telezimka, a, un a specific unstoppable diarrhea caused by eating spoiled rotten food. Most died after two weeks. But I want to show you a beautiful act of resistance and a beautiful act of humanity. And you know, within all these horrible stories, there's beautiful stories of human beings showing us the best that a human being can be. And one of them is one of my heroes. His name is Maurice Smaller. And he was from Prague. You can see where his studio was in the Corona building on, um, on Wenceslas Square. He has a nice um, art studio there and an intellectual circle. And they're very involved in the arts. Um, and he's an artist and sells artwork. And when he sent to Telezin, he could have worked in one of the art workshops. Instead, he chooses something very strange. He goes to work in the ward for elderly men who have urine tract diseases. It's the worst ward in the ghetto. It's dirty and it's smelly and there's no hope for these poor people. And many of them just die. And Morris Muller sat with these elderly people stroked their foreheads, asked them questions, talked to them, and drew 400 portraits of elderly Jewish men before they died. Many of them are anonymous. We don't even know who they are. But he draws them with so much dignity and so much humanity. And to really dedicate himself totally to just spending time with these people who really needed that in their last moments of life, their last days, a human person, someone to sit with them and listen to them and draw them and remember them. I think it's a beautiful act of, of humanity and resistance. He's not gonna let them be forgotten. We see these drawings that he makes. He's not in the ghetto for very long. He's only there for I think less than a year and the last month of his life before he sent to Auschwitz, he just can't draw anymore. He's so overwhelmed with how horrible the ghetto is. He just stops drawing but to leave behind such a beautiful legacy and an image of what these people look like and of their humanity. Another artist is Charlotte Borsova, who does survive, an amazing woman artist. And many, many of these artists were women also. Makes this drawing called Mr. Schuauer, excuse my pronunciation, visiting his wife. The Schuauers were from Vienna. And we know exactly when they arrive because you can't see it in the reproduction, but she writes down their transport numbers on the suitcase. And we know that he was born around 1862. She was born about 1863. They're only in the ghetto for three or four weeks before they are sent on and murdered in Treblinka. And she draws them in the attic, in the conditions and the overcrowding. Men and women are separated, but he loves his wife. He comes and visits her and he captures this little moment of the elderly couple who are forced apart because of the living conditions to spend time, come to spend time with each other. And to think from, from here, this poor couple are sent on to Treblinka and murder and Charlotte de Barsova catches that moment. Sadly, most of the people of Terezin were deported. However, if almost 33,000 die in the camp, 33, 34,000, the majority of the elderly people, the people who died in Theresienstadt were elderly people. But we see here a well, drawing by Bedrick Fita called Before the Transport. And when we look at it together, we see that the artist just wants us to concentrate on this figure. He doesn't need to make a background. The light is very unrealistic because her face is in shadow. 
that's very symbolic. Her as a human being, as a woman with a face and a past, isn't important anymore to the people who created this place. Does everyone see where the light is? The light is on her star. To the Nazis, that's all she is. She's not a human being. She's not a person of words. She's not a person with a past. Now she's just a person. Now she's just a star, another Jew to be deported. And notice the symbolism here. Her hands are one on top of each other, useless. She's sitting on the little few little peccolo, the few little things that she owns in her life, soon to be deported, murdered, and forgotten. Well, that's the story of most of the elderly people of Terezin, um, Terezinstadt. By 1943, they stopped deporting elderly people. Um, but by night, they still deported them, but they were no longer deported on what we call the Alta Transporta, the 16,000 people who were deported in the fall of 1942 to make more room in the ghetto. Um, and when you visit, if you ever get a chance to go to Poland and visit Theresienstadt, uh, not Theresienstadt, um, Treblinka, remember also that among those almost million people who were murdered there were these elderly people from Germany and Austria who arrived by way of Hevels. Children is a big dilemma also because who is the hope of the Jewish future? Their kids. And if there's not enough food in the ghetto and there's only a certain amount of food and the food has to be divided up and it has to be divided up in such a way that it'll keep the people who are more useful alive. And if children are the future of the Jewish people, the Jewish leadership makes the decision to try and give the best conditions they can to children. And the building you're looking at today, if you go to Telezin, today it's the memorial. It's the, um, the museum of the museum of the the Terrazin. Um, before, when this was a garrison town, this was the school of the town. And we'll see what happens to it during the time that the Jews are forced into the ghetto. Well, this becomes what's called a kinderheim, a children's home for boys. And a decision is made. At the beginning, children were with their parents. But a decision is made, the parents have to work. Um, conditions are incredibly harsh in the ghetto. How are we going to make sure the children have food. You're not allowed to formally educate children in the ghetto. You know, we make a pact with children that we're going to educate you and give you the best food and give you the best possibility so that you'll have a start in life. They want to do that in the ghetto. The only way you could do that is to kind of separate children into these homes to make sure they got better food, to make sure they were secretly educated, which is amazing. Secretly educating children in the ghetto. If they were caught, they would have been killed. Um, where they can have some comradeship and kids are kids where they can try and have a little bit of a childhood in a place that takes away your childhood. So this building is where they had the kinder homes for boys, um, including Children's Home 101. And those boys create what they call the Republic of Skid. Now you can imagine you have little boys between the ages of 13 and, and 16, and maybe some of you are students of that age. The parents aren't with you. Most of these kids are in shock. They had left home. They left all their comforts of home. They left, you know, their friends. They left their life behind to live in this terrible place with a bunch of strangers who they don't know. And they all have to get along. And instead of mom and dad, they have what's called in Hebrew, madrichim. Madrichim are counselors. And these counselors are really dedicated to the kids. And in this boy's home, they decide, you know what, we're gonna make ourselves into a republic. And Skid was a republic written about in, uh, uh, in from Russia, I believe a hundred years before, um, and maybe wrong, it uh, uh, comes from Russia, of this, this kind of, this republic. And the boys are gonna be like that republic. They're all gonna take care of each other. They're all gonna be there one for the other. And they make an anthem. And here's their anthem. Oh, what glory all are cheering. The whole of one is on its feet. Remember, this is Boys Home 101. Government has come to being of the Republic of Shkin. Every man is our brother, Christian or Jewish kid. And now do we march under the banner of the Republic of Shkin. Insult us, no one shall dare, no one shall dare or hit to hit. To work hard, we swear to honor the Republic of Shkin. So what does that mean? It means if you get a package from home, you're going to share it. 
If you have to clean together, you're going to help each other clean. If some kid is upset and crying in the middle of the night because he had a nightmare or is missing his parents, you go and you, you give him a hug. They're going to work together to give each other as good a life as possible in this terrible place. That's pretty amazing that these kids were able to do that. Instead of being you know, filled with self-pity and, oh, poor me, they're trying to build something positive out of a very in a very difficult situation. And one of the things these kids do is they make a magazine. And the magazine, there were many magazines in this ghetto. There were also magazines made by girls. One of them is called Banaka, Banako. But we're going to concentrate on a magazine called Venom because in the history of World War II, this is the longest lasting clandestine magazine in all of World War II history, made by the little boys of um, the young men, if you will. We have uh, uh, young men of that age, again, like 13 to 16, of Boys Home 101. And Vedem and Chekney's in the lead. And you see covers from this magazine. And this one on the left is created by a brilliant kid called Petr Gintz. And we'll talk about him in a minute. And how are you going to fight the Nazis in a place where you don't have any way of fighting back? You can see the cannon itself is Vedem, is the magazine. The cannonballs are aimed towards this big balloon that says in Czech, old world order. And the cannonballs say mirth, satire, and laughter. That's how we're going to do it. We're going to make fun of them. We're going to have a you know, laugh and, and keep each other happy. That's how we're going to fight against the system. Poor kids. In this one, we also see all these things falling on the Republic of Kids, in solidarity, culture. These are kids who are dealing with a lot of stuff. Not only are they dealing with a lot of stuff, for my, my friends out there who are 14 or 15 or something, they're not easy times. There are times when you go through what to call them. Your body's changing, your way you think it's changing. All of these things are changing and it's all happening under the scrutiny of 40 or 50 other kids in a place that's not your home without your parents, when you really have almost no food and the kids are trying to deal with so many things at once. And one of them, um, and this is all inside of Vedem, um, and they give themselves little nicknames that are supposed to hide their identities. And Pner, who is actually Yuri Zafner, says, when children all over the world have their own rooms, we have bunks 70 by 30 centimeters, which is very small. They have their freedom. We live like chained dogs. Truly then, in place of their closets full of toys, you must allow us to have at least half a meter of space behind our heads. You must realize that we're still only children like children everywhere else. We may be mature thanks to Tevazin, but we are children just the same. And this drawing by Petr Ginch shows us the conditions that these children are living under. Now they're living in this very, very crowded home and very small beds. They don't own any possessions, but little things are allowed to take with them. They have to try and keep the place clean. They have to keep the place orderly. They have to respect each other. They, there's all these things that are put on them. Um, it's not something that, that children are really used to. And it's not something they wanted. It's not something they chose. It's something that's thrown on them. Another one, and he's one of my heroes, his name is Hannes Hachenberg. He's killed at the age of 14 in Auschwitz. This kid would have been a brilliant, brilliant writer. We know he was probably an orphan. We don't know a lot about him, but we know that he writes brilliant poetry and plays. And he writes this poem, look at these five little faces here about these little boys. And listen to the, the, how he talks about it. He says five. This morning at seven, so bright and so early, five novels lay there, sewn up in a sack. Sewn up in a sack like all of our lives, they lay there so silent, so silent, all five. Five books that flung back the curtain of silence, calling for freedom and not for the world. There's somebody's novels, somebody who loves them. They call out now, they cried, they shed tears, and they pleaded they hadn't been finished, the pitiful five. They declare to the world that the state trades in bodies and slowly they vanished and went out of sight. They kept their eyes open, they looked for the world, but nothing they found, they were silent, all five. And I think we understand those five unwritten, unfinished novels represents these, these young kids. Like a novel, there's so much more to be written, 
but they're tied in a sack and they have no freedom and nobody cares about them and nobody wants to help them. And there was a book that was written, I'm not sure he would have even known about it because it was, it's written in Terzin, but only after 1943 um, by a Jewish writer and it's called the, the Five. And it's about five, the childhood of five little Czech kids growing up before the war. Um, I'm not sure that um, Hannes Hachenberg had any knowledge of this book, but I like to make that connection. And look at the little faces. There, you know, guys, if you just put uh, the clothes you're wearing on these faces, they would look exactly like we do. The only distance is the 80 years separating us from them. They love sports. I was just in Prague. My son and I went to a Slavia, Prague, um, Ranek Ostrava game, and Czech football soccer fans are insane and they love sports. You really can't have sports here in this terrible ghetto. But they make up a league called the Terezin League. And they have football games, soccer games, sorry. Um, if it says football guys, it's the European way of saying soccer. Um, and they have soccer matches. And it's the only real spots of light for many of these kids. And Petr Gintz writes about this in, in Vedum. And he does something a lot of people complain about. He says, you know what, in Prague, if they're, all the players are playing for is money. They're not playing for the love of the sport. It's just money. It's money making. But then he says, here in Terezin Football League, what do players on the winning team receive? And what did the organizers of the match get when the Dresden Barracks are bursting with spectators? Nothing. Here they play with the true Elan for their club. They play for the sake of playing and not for the money. Just as some poets call for art for art's sakes, so we'll call for sports for sports sake and not money. So here in, in Terezin, even though they're prisoners and even though they can't have a big real you know, football game, they're still playing for the love of the sport. This is one of the things children write about, uh, read about in Terezin, in the magazine Venom. They're studying, it's, it's hard for us to imagine what it must mean to be locked into a ghetto. If you don't like school, what happens when you can't go to school anymore? When school becomes something dangerous and secret, you wanna learn about the world and what the world looks like. And Petr Gintz makes this map about the big, beautiful world outside of the ghetto that he hopes to live and see one day. And look at the, what a beautiful map that is and how he's got it all written there in Shepo. This my thing. I'm going to talk for about five more minutes because I don't want to. Um, uh, here we see Dr. Nahartabi, who was a teacher um, of Semitic languages. He teaches Hebrew and he teaches um, Arabic in the ghetto. And why would kids living in Theresienstadt ghetto want to know Hebrew and Arabic? The dream was that the war would end and they would move on to the land of Israel and the land of Israel. And all Israeli kids have to learn Arabic in school also, classical Arabic, which is very difficult. They would be able to come here to the state of Israel, the new Jewish state that they were dreaming would happen and they would be good citizens who could speak both Hebrew and Arabic. And Dr. Nahartabi and most of the kids who studied this never got a chance to live that dream out. Here is Petr Gintz, the brilliant little boy whose artwork I just showed you. Um, and I'm just gonna talk about, we talked about music also. Well, not only did they have children's, um, children's magazines, they also put on performances. And one of the most amazing performances they put on, oh, that was in the middle, sorry, I'll get back there. I just wanna quickly talk about Helva Vaisova before we get to Bar. And I promise you, I would tell you about her as well. Helga is from Prague, and when she arrives in the ghetto with her mother and her beloved father, Helga's very, very close to her father, she makes him this drawing. She's 12 years old, and she makes daddy a drawing of kids having fun in the snow. Father sees him and says, Helga, don't, don't, don't draw these fantasies. Tell me what you see. Draw what you see. Record what you see. And for the rest of her time in this terrible place, Helga Vaisova draws the horrors of the ghetto. She draws scavenging in the garbage. She drew the transport that I showed you. She draws people waiting in line just to eat. She shows us the horrors of the ghetto. Another thing that they do in this ghetto that to me is always um, shy, so beautiful, they still have religious and observe Judaism in the ghetto. Um, 
they're thrown into the ghetto because they're Jewish. Some people might say, because I'm Jewish, I don't even wanna think about being Jewish. I wanna disconnect from that. But so many people reconnect with their Judaism. And Eric Lichblau Leskli draws a picture of his wife who in her barracks celebrates Shabbat, every Shabbat. And they were in Bet HaChalutz. Bet HaChalutz were young women who were dreaming of coming to Israel. A Chalutz is someone who builds the land up, a pioneer. And these women kept Shabbat every Saturday and they would have um, an oneg and you get together and you sing songs and tell stories about the land of Hebrew, Israel and speak in Hebrew. And you can see here in their barracks, they drew chalutziot. Those are women who are tilling the fields and building the land of Israel. And they're keeping that dream alive there in that terrible place of Tel Aviv. We see here also services in the attic. Jews had secret Kol Nidre, secret Yom Kippur in the attic. Um, people put on tefillin in the ghetto. See, the fact that it didn't diminish their being Jewish, it made so many more want to explore what it means to be Jewish, I think is an amazing act of resistance. Um, and now we'll go to the culture and boom the bar. Together with all of these other cultural pursuits, there are operas that are written. The Nazis said the Jews don't bring anything original into the world. All they do is bring bad things in. In this ghetto, they perform operas, they perform plays. And one of them, which is a children's opera, which is only about half an hour long, was written um, right before the Holocaust. It's per first performed in 1938 in the... Um, the orphanage in Bel um, Belgique Street in Prague. And the writer brings it with him, some of the music with him to the ghetto and they re fix up the music so that it can be performed for a very small um, orchestra. And Bundebar is a story of, um, of a, um, uh, two children whose mother is very sick and they want to get her milk, but they don't have money to get milk. And there's an evil organ grinder called Bundabar. Bundabar in Czech is something like bumblebees. And he's very, very mean. And the children start making music and people are yelling at them, don't make the music. But then this dog and a cat and a bird join in and make this beautiful music and people start to try to give them money. Um, and then Bundabar gets very angry and there's a whole blah. And in the end, the cat and the dog and the bird and the children sing a beautiful chorus and they defeat Bundabar. In the end, they have this beautiful kind of musical thing, um, which we'll see in a minute. So here's how it goes. This is an act. Notice the organ grinder. I'll tell you about that amazing little boy in a minute. If the kids look a little nervous there, that was performed almost 50 times, 50, 55 times, but that particular performance was filmed by the Nazis um, to be used in a propaganda film. So the kids must have been very, very scared. They're filming their opera. They have to sit in the audience and there's cameramen filming. Um, it was filmed, it was actually a Jewish, um, a Jewish director called Kurt Garon is forced to make this film and they must have been very stressed because the children seemed very tense but that opera gave them a moment to fly out of the ghetto and be free for, for half an hour when they saw the opera and that last bit of music you saw the translation is we won a victory over the tyrants mean sound trumpets beat your drum and show us your esteem we won a victory since we are not fearful since we were not tearful because we marched along singing our happy song bright joyful and cheerful he who loves his papa mama and native land who wants the tyrants end, join us hand in hand and be welcome friend who is the tyrant you can guess it's hitler um and it's, it's an amazing opera that the children put on now this little guy here hans treichlinger 
he was the one who played the organ grinder. And it's a, he's, it's a bad, he's supposed to represent someone evil. But this kid was so brilliant and he put so much empathy and you know, even maybe someone who's bad and have a little bit of something to love that he becomes a favorite. Here he is, a favorite of everybody, he becomes the darling of the ghetto. Um, and he got extra food and people, oh, look, there's, um, there's Hamza, there's the kid that plays the uh, organ grinder. And that poor child was murdered also in Auschwitz, very sadly. An original opera is written in the ghetto called The Emperor of Atlantis that explores what would happen if death takes a break and death doesn't want to kill anyone anymore. What would happen? Um, and in the end, death comes back, but death said he's going to come back only if this evil emperor of Atlantis is the first one that he takes. And the emperor of Atlantis, of course, is a, is a type of metaphor for Hitler. And Victor Ullmann, who was the, um, the, the writer of the opera, and most of the people who took part in the opera were murdered in Auschwitz, never had a chance to hear their own music performed. I believe the first time it was performed was in the 1970s. Um, if anyone knows the exact date, um, you can put it in the chat down there. And I'm going to end with this, because I can go on and on about Theresienstadt, but we only have a little bit of time. This is a beautiful drawing by Charlotte Borsova, the same woman who drew Mr. and Mr. Schuauer, the ones who were sent in to Treblinka, that elderly couple. And it's a couple with a baby. And I have a very dear friend called Jana Marcos, whose parents met in Terezin and fell in love with Terezin. And people fell in love there and people did human things in such a terrible, inhumane place. And, and the fact that Charlotte de Borsova drew this very tender moment of a couple with a child, we don't know what happened with them. We know it probably wasn't a very good fate. They probably didn't survive. But for that brief moment, people could still feel all of those things. And Ruth Bundy, who's a very famous survivor from this ghetto writes, and that is the importance of transmitting the material on ghetto Theresienstadt to future generations, not only as a testimony of an error, but a testimony for the readiness of individuals to accept responsibility for the community. Remember I showed you the pictures that uh, Moritz Muller drew of the elderly sick men. Not to give up, Testimony for the ability of man to learn, to create, to laugh, to love, even in the most difficult of circumstances. So friends, I hope that by showing you through the artist's eyes, through the eyes of music and the eyes of poetry, um, that in the midst of horrors, people still can create and people still want to, to love and people still want to care about other people and still want to record and, and, and show what happened. And I think that's why it's so important to keep the memory of these places alive. And I hope I kind of whetted your appetite that you will explore this more and want to learn more by yourselves. So thank you very much. Um, I will stop sharing. And if anyone has any questions, I'm all ears. Thank you so much, Liz. That was a fabulous presentation. I really, really enjoyed it. And I learned a lot. Thank you. I see we have a few questions in the chat. We have some from Miriam Fisher. Um, she says, do you have the work of Adolf Ausenberg? There was an exhibit of his work at Yad Vashem a few years back, which didn't know yes, there was I, a Sibani family. Uh, I do. I have like a little private collection of all these works. Um, he was one of the artists of Tauzi. And if you look up, I'll give you some resources. The, um, the museum of, um, the Jewish Museum of Prague has a wonderful website with a great, archive where you can find all kinds of stuff. You have to translate it into Czech and you'll find some of his work there. Also Leo Beck Institute has a really beautiful and extensive website where you can look up things. Bet Terezin and Jerusalem and, and uh, Kibbutz, um, um, but the Kibbutz also has a very good archive and Ghetto Fighters Museum has most of its artwork online. Yad Vashem doesn't have its artwork online yet, but there are plenty of sources where you can find his work. Um, I think she referenced the Leo Beck um, Institute. She said uh, 34 of his works are at the Center for Jewish History in perfect condition. And she yeah. asked, how were the drawings um, gotten out and brought to, brought out of Terezin? That's a great question, too. Um, unlike Warsaw Ghetto, where artists also worked, um, but Warsaw Ghetto was destroyed. 
And we do have a few, very few works that survive, many of them that were in the, among the, the Ringelblum archives, the Onik Shabbat, it's like a handful. Um, but in Tel Aviv, the ghetto was not destroyed and artwork was hidden. It was found um, hidden in different places. It was found behind walls, it was found in attics. Um, so that's why we're still discovering in some cases, new things from that, um, that ghetto. Some ghettos artwork was snuck out but that's um, mainly how most of it was was um, preserved. Very interesting. Um, was it dangerous to draw things that showed the terrible conditions of the ghetto? Oh, definitely. Not only that, um, there was a point where they were allowed to make artwork that was kind of, um, there was a, a whole studio where Jews were forced to make artwork for the Nazis that wasn't the technical studio. Um, but a group of artists did this, the secret drawings at night, and they were discovered in 1944 and what became known as the Artists Affair of June 1944. About seven of them were arrested for making horror propaganda. They were brought to the commandant of the camp. They were interrogated, and they, them, them and their families were thrown into the little fortress, the uh, concentration camp of Tavazin. And only two of them survived. Bajik Frita did not survive, neither did his wife, but his little boy, Tommy Frita, did survive. And um, the only two that I know that survived, one of them was um, Robert Scholler, the artist who drew the Jews on the Steps, the architect. And, um, and um, what's his name? And blah, 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 uh, uh, Leo Haas. And Leo Haas later on became like a surrogate father to, um, to Tommy until his wife died. And then Tommy became, um, went to live in the Jewish home in Prague. So that's how um, very, very dangerous. And they paid with their lives for having the, the bravery to make art against the Nazis. And art against the Nazis is basically showing the truth of the ghetto. And it wasn't only them, um, Fleischmann, another great artist, I could do a whole talk about him, was a doctor. And he's drawing separately, independently of other people. So some artists work together in a collective secretly and some of them are doing it independently. Um, I just told um, Miriam, she wanted to know, uh, wanted the websites about Ausenberg in the chat. And I said that I could put you two in touch after the program. Fabulous, put me in touch, Miriam. I'm gonna run out after, but tonight I'll send you, uh, send me your email and I'll send you whatever I could find to find more stuff. And I have some of my little personal collection and I'll send you some drawings also. That's great. Uh, we had a comment from Helen Chassett. Um, Steve Fisher has produced a play called The Last Boys based on these boys. I believe the Ven Vedem boys. Yeah. It was produced on Broadway and is now being optioned for a film. Wow. Wow. Yeah, they were amazing kids. They really were. And it's very, very painful to think about what these boys and what these girls would have given the world. They were so talented. And the Europe they came from was a Europe that was so, you know, arts and sports and all these things that are such nice, nice things to, for children to be exposed to. And they really were the best of that. And the majority of them did not survive. So we owe it to them to remember them. Do we have any other questions or comments from the audience? Great. So that's, thank you. And please look up these people. Look up the ghetto. Remember it. Um, I think it's it's our job. We owe it to them to be the ones to remember them and to make sure they're never forgotten. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Liz. We really appreciate thank you. Having you guys. Thank you so much for having me. And I hope the hurricane isn't too bad. So <laughs> bye bye from Jerusalem. Thank you. Bye, everyone. We hope that the rest of you can join us for our last two programs later today at 1 p.m. We have the tattoo Torah with Dr. Uh, Miriam Klein Kasanoff. And we also have a film viewing tomorrow, all day, the Richie Boys documentary. Thank you again. And we uh, hope you have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Closing the room now.